everyone, and welcome to this executive briefing where we will be sharing how you can better support the mental health and well being of your leaders. On our panel today is R3's Chief Clinical Officer, Dr. George Fergolius, and Senior Director of Key Customer Partnerships, Sarah Tolbert. Welcome to you both, and thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Jimmy. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. And to talk about a very relevant topic. Absolutely. And so let's just dive in right to that topic and give kind of our audience uh, what they're looking for today. So there are a lot of reports coming out sharing startling numbers around burnout, stress, and mental health concerns amongst leaders. Can you share from your mutual perspectives how the current state of mental health, stress, and burnout at the leadership level within organizations is going? Yeah, our leaders are stressed out. Um, they're in positions where they have to maintain maintain high performance, not only within their organization, um, but also manage their teams below them. Um, and they're doing this in a world that's stressed out and it's complex right now. Uh, they're working long hours and they're under constant pressure to uh, perform and inspire with a lot of responsibilities. And again, not only are they doing this in the workplace, but then they have to go home and navigate their own stressors that they're facing at home. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's really insightful, Sarah. Um, in addition, the world's more complex, right? I mean, so we're, we're still rebounding from the pandemic and the impact on that. We have different waves of, co of, of, uh, of uh, different variants of COVID coming out, which isn't necessarily suggesting another lockdown, but still it raises some concerns. Uh, almost all of us are immunosuppressed because a couple of years ago we stayed inside for two years. You've got um, a wide range of financial concerns with kind of the, re the, the recession that hasn't quite been born yet. Like we keep talking about it and talking about it and it isn't quite there. Uh, the Fed raising rates, which has mass implications of access to capital, uh, geopolitical issues, the Ukraine-Russian war and the impact on that. Very recently, like days, and we're seeing the horrific events in Israel and uh, versus Hamas and the impact on Israeli people and Palestinians um, So in, in, in Gaza. I mean, so there is just so much going on right now, in addition to everything that Sarah is talking about. Um, and on top of that, you've got a lot of companies debating this issue of remote versus hybrid versus return to office and all the complexities that bring in. So leaders are carrying a whole lot right now in terms of uh, in terms of a lot of those stressors, both personally and, and professionally. Great. And you bring, you know, I'm glad you mentioned on that personal and professional because, you know, really it's hard to not carry one into the other these days with a lot of us being remote and working from home. Um, so from your perspective and looking at the varying industries, you know, some are going to say, you know, there's these high test, high stress industries. They're definitely feeling it more than others. From your perspective, does it matter by industry or a leader is a leader regardless of where you're at and that stressors are all the same? You know, what's your perspective on that as we look at the different industries and how this, you know, as they, some might say, crisis within the leadership space you know, how is that impacting them? Yeah, certainly each industry has their unique nuances and the unique stressors that are that are driving some of their, their internal pressures. But we're seeing the trend of leaders who are stressed out and carrying a lot of weight, as uh, George mentioned, across all industries. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's an equal opportunity impact, right, in terms of these stressors and the impact on people's well-being. Um, in, in our experience in that consulting space, what I think we find is, and this is kind of my own anecdotal kind of take, so I want to own that part of it, but about 80% of all the industries we see are having these common themes that Sarah has been mentioning and which we're going to continue to talk about over the next hour. Um, and then there might be about 20%, maybe 10% of variants that really relates to unique factors um, that impact that industry. And what I find is that the intensity of those unique stressors will go up and down and impact different industries at different times, right? So for example, recession concerns, right? Um, the impact of, of the, the geopolitical conflicts, um, how it drives people necessarily maybe to buy bonds and the impact that that might have on interest rates, right? That's gonna hit banking sector, the FinTech sector, 
um, fi other financial sectors in a way that may not be relevant to other sectors, right? Um, so there's a number of issues that I think we have to be mindful of that are common, and that's the, the benefit of well-being programs, that they can be used across sectors, but it's important then to cater the specific needs of your culture, your organization, and your sector, and that's where a tailored solution really is important, uh, building off both of those. Yeah, great, great, great thoughts there in terms of that kind of tailoring need. It can't be a one-size-fits-all collectively, you know, knowing that there are those nuances that need to be addressed in the program. So what's the impact? I mean, we, we talk about, we know obviously the personal impact, you know, burnout, stress, there's a personal impact to not addressing mental health in your leaders, but what's the impact on the organization when they have senior leaders who are feeling stressed and burned out or at a level where they might be, you know, having mental health um, concerns that are, you know, how do they, how is that impacting these work environments and ultimately the bottom line of some of these organizations? Yeah, as we mentioned, those leaders are, have high expectations, a lot of responsibility, and they need to sustain, sustain this performance. When they're burnt out and stressed, um, it often will abil uh, diminish their ability to do this. And the shift um, that you might see is a negative shift in the overall culture. It is a bit of a trickle down effect where if leaders aren't setting the example that it's okay to take some time off, set some boundaries with your calendar, um, take care of yourself, their teams will see that and follow suit. Um, so shift into culture, lower productivity across, across all levels, and then ultimately um, turnover, which is very costly regardless of, of the industry. Yeah, I think those are critical, um, critical insights. The only thing I could add to what Sarah just shared is, and it's more of not even adding something new, it's kind of just uh, extrapolating a bit, is there's a pressure for leaders, especially in, in larger corporations um, and many industries or sectors, to um, show strength, right? You want to show strength to your people. You want to show strength to your competitors. You want to show strength to your uh, um, um, stakeholders, right? And investors, of course, that's super important. One of the downsides though, is if all you ever do is show strength, you do not model vulnerability. You do not model how do you fall and get back up? Because that's resilience, right? Resilience is not just staying on top all time. Resilience is about how do I stumble and either prevent a deep, deep stumble, that's a part of resilience, or if I really do deeply stumble, how do I get back on my feet, right? Um, I think it was initially Joe Lewis who said, yeah, sure, I get knocked down more than any other boxer, but I also get up more than any other boxer, right? And that's the core of resilience. And so when, when leaders don't show that at some degree, regardless of programs they support, regardless of big um, promotions, regardless of big rollouts of well-being programs, people see that in their leadership. And, and my message to my team, you know, I'm, as a chief clinical officer, if I'm saying, you guys take time off, take time for yourself, it's okay to stumble, but they never see me so much as stub my toe, that's mixed messaging. And that makes them more uh, or less likely to be vulnerable. And if you're less likely to be vulnerable, you're less likely to take risks and take chances. And if you're not taking risks or taking chances, you're not innovating because innovation is born out of taking risks, right? Uh, thinking of creative new ideas to promote the business, to promote your ideas. So it's important that there, there's a real connection to leadership um, showing strength in vulnerability and then allowing that kind of giving permission across the organization for other people to show that. Um, so it's, as we as we talk through the rest of today and if we get to Q&A later, those are important things to keep in mind. Yeah, I love that you mentioned, you know, the leadership having to show and kind of model that behavior. Because even if the employee doesn't directly report to you, being that you're a leader, they're watching you. and they they need to see that vulnerability or see that promotion of you know creating your boundaries or you know getting or seeking mental health support so that they can feel psychologically safe to yeah. do so as well especially in an industry that maybe historically has been stigmatic around not doing that 
Yeah. And, and what's interesting is we intuitively get that, right? I mean, any of us that are parents or have been around loved ones, sisters, brothers that are parents, you see what happens when a 12 month old or a 15 month old is running in trips and stumbles, right? The first thing they do is they look at the parent for their reaction or maybe the adult in the room for their reaction. And if the adult is overreacting, then they suddenly start crying, right? Now, I'm not comparing leaders to, you know, parents and employees to, to infants or toddlers, but there is that kind of um, dynamic where if we don't model the ability to fall and stumble, but also the, the propensity to get back up, then we also deprive our people of showing their resilience, right? Of demonstrating that they can do tough things and rebound from difficult situations. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, that kind of like walk the walk and talk the talk, right? <laughs> or however that phrase goes, I probably said a little backwards. But so, you know, obviously a lot of organizations have EAPs and they say, well, we've got an EAP program or traditional other, because some of the new well beings, there's lots of apps, there's lots of solutions out there. So, what are you seeing as methods that organizations are using that are specifically taking care of the leaders? You know, particularly the, 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 the nuances impacting leaders at that different level, you know, what are some of the methods that you you are seeing out there? Yeah, as you mentioned, most organizations do offer a wide variety of benefits, um, but often we're hearing and seeing that people don't know how to access them. Um, they are not accessible in a way that that means something to the leaders, or they're just not specifically focused on their leadership or they're, they're not meeting them where they're at. So they're, they're falling short a little bit to, to hit that mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it, it, Sarah kind of said it, like we're, we're finding that there's a huge gap in, in, again, across industries around kind of catering to the leadership. And again, it's not favoritism. It's just understanding that people have common human needs, right? But you know, again, 80%, we all may have similar common needs for well-being and support. And then there's that variance, right? Of what a CEO needs and the realities um, and the dilemmas that senior leadership or C-suite executives or executive VP executives deal with versus someone that has a solid job, but is doing an eight to five. It's not that one is better or worse, but there are unique variables that play into that, right? Um, and so I think it's important to keep in mind that those really need to be tailored to those groups. Um, so you're, you're providing a benefit, you're providing supports that resonate with what their actual needs are. Um, so again, I'm just, I'm, I'm, again, I'm extrapolating a bit on what Sarah said. Um, and that can be tough to do because you really need to understand first, as Sarah suggested, what those needs are. Yeah. So from your perspective, and maybe George, you want to take this one on and Sarah kind of chime in as well. You know, what are some of those unique, you know, nuances that leaders are experiencing that makes it a little bit or even a lot different in some regards to the general employee population? What are those unique areas that employers should be taking into consideration if they haven't already? Well, one that immediately comes to mind is one of the one of the biggest currencies for leaders. Again, forget what's all sectors, all industries, and individuals manage this differently. Of course, there there is individual variance, um, but time, right? So, what we have learned over over many years of doing this work, the notion of saying to a senior executive, "Hey, we're going to link you, or we're going to provide." clinical support or clinical based services for maybe depression or a little bit of anger management, or maybe you're, you're struggling with the risk of relapse from a prior addiction issue, whatever. And we're going to set you up with therapy every Tuesday at 2 PM. And you just got to drive 25 minutes to get to the therapist's office. That doesn't work for an executive that every two weeks is traveling to the, you know, to the Pacific rim and doing, you know, large stakeholder meetings and presentations. So leveraging virtual sessions, um, um, it wasn't long ago that I was uh, consulting with, working with a very high senior VP um, at a very large corporation that shall not be named because you guys will recognize it. Um, and he had anxiety and specifically he had this rash, if you will, of performance anxiety that started not a literal rash, but I mean this outbreak, if you will, of performance anxiety that he thought was under control for 10 years. Well, he was on a world tour. And he needed me to engage with him 
10, 15 minutes before he was going on stage in front of a thousand stakeholders. And he was in Singapore and saying to him, um, I'll pencil you in Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern time. That just didn't work. So catering to their schedule, um, um, ease of use is another one I'll highlight before I hand it over to Sarah, because I know she has insights. Um, you know, I, 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 don't even ha- I don't even have it that hard, but I wake up in the morning and if I don't get my work done by 10 or 1030, my day is taken over. It's taken over by other demands from the organization, client you know, demands, my team's demands, and there's nothing wrong there. That comes with the territory. But I know that I have to cater my work and my productivity and my checking of email and so on to that kind of situation. So mm-hmm. if somebody were working with me and said, hey, let's set a standing meeting on Wednesday afternoon at 2 p.m., 2 p.m., my hair's on fire by then. That isn't going to work. And I certainly won't be in a position to process growth and challenging myself and so on. So these are some of the unique variables that people that have just more of a steady nine to five job, they have very similar stressors, but they may have some different dynamics in terms of how they structure their life and structure their work life um, synergy. If you will. Sarah, yeah. thoughts on that? anything to add? Yeah, I think you hit, you hit the big ones. The only thing I'll add is and JB, you mentioned it earlier, that as much work that has been done, there's still a stigma. And so there is this, again, perceived kind of weakness. And so our leaders aren't always the first ones to raise their hand and say that I need help. And so when they do, it has to work, right? You have to get it right. It has to be easy, accessible, and hit the mark every time. There's, there's, there's no room for error there because if they raise their hand once and it doesn't work, they might not do that again. And yeah, thanks, Sarah. That made me think of one other thing I wanted to add. So it's kind of nice how you're kind of stimulating my thought here. Um, often in this space, we we use the metaphor of elite athletes, right? Right. If LeBron <laughs> blows out a hamstring, right? or Mahomes and foot blow, blows out, you know, twists his ankle. I'm not saying breaks it or sprains it per se, or, or, or pulls his Achilles heel really bad. Those teams, those trainers, those performance trainers don't have the luxury of doing a four or five week rehabilitation, right? Now, granted, mm-hmm. they have the best in the world. They have all kinds of tech behind them, but there is this thing of getting quickly to ROI. What is the return on investment from outcome basis? So if I have anxiety, and I'm a leader, and I need to get back into the game fairly quickly, I don't have the luxury of talking with a therapist for 18 weeks, even eight weeks, and gradually over time. So it also sometimes changes, whether it's performance coaching or clinical services, clinical therapeutic services, it kind of changes a bit of the landscape. And what we find with leaders in these organizations is it's not that they expect you know a Harry Potter overnight wave the magic wand and I'm better. But they do expect, hey, let's get moving. Let's get to work on this. And let's get to a place where we're starting to see outcomes. Because I can't afford to be debilitated with whatever this issue is for four weeks, right? Because there's big, big stakes if I don't get back to being as effective as I possibly can be. Yeah, that pressure of always needing to perform, you know, can't show that weakness, need to always constantly be at the top of your game. They put me here for a reason. I need to be able to perform at that, not taking care of some of those key things that could be impacting that performance overall. And how do you get me back on the field, right? Quickly, right? Yeah, yep, absolutely. And sometimes, we have to coach, and sometimes as we're building a panel, we have to coach a bit our, our experts, our clinicians, our performance coaches, um, a little bit just to reorient them that, you know, you know, it's not that we're overly pressured, But we need to kind of reorient that getting to an ROI, getting to noticeable outcomes is really important to do that at speed because that's what these folks need at that level. Yeah. So I know you guys have kind of addressed some of the areas that we were going to be going into. So something I wanted to ask a question on, you know, is as we think about stigma, you know, there's stigma at that leadership level. You know, so you might have leaders who are promoting mental health to their teams saying, take your vacation, take your PTO, you know, you know, when you log off, you log off, don't think about work, maybe aren't modeling some of those behaviors because they don't view that 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 expectation is the same for them. 
So in terms of like, and some of that's driven by stigma, you know, we have, you know, we think of some of the industries, you know, like the legal industry where there's this strong stigma, you think of, um, you know, maybe some of the, the other larger organizations, very high pressure. If I show that weakness then somebody's just going to step right over me and take my role, how can an organization, you know, how can having the right type of a solution help to break down that, that barrier of stigma? You just, I know this, you know, this isn't something that I maybe brought to the attention of you all beforehand, but from your perspective, how can that help? How can we start having yeah. different dialogue internally for that, for leaders? I think it starts with the culture shift, right? By the leadership bringing in and fostering this change of providing um, very dedicated and directly focused on leadership support. Um, it, it, it tells the, the story that we care and we are serious about this. And we want to see that culture shift to begin to see that trickle down, um, trickle down effect and having an internal champion who, like you said, Jamie, not only walks the walk, talks the talk, but walks the walk um, and who can promote it internally and start to see that shift. And it's not going to happen overnight. And it takes the heavy legwork at the beginning to really understand the culture and understand what the drivers are and focus on that. Yeah, I love that. Um, and I love how when I have these talks with you, Sarah, again, it stimulates thoughts that I wasn't having just a minute ago, but I kind of, I love that. Because what I love what you're saying is you're talking about culture and I think you said story, right? I think that's really important. We don't talk enough about what is the story that leaders are sharing about the importance of well-being and its place in this organization, right? You know, fill in the blank of whatever the organization is. And then that means there needs to be important messaging. And for me, what's so important with all of that to break down stigma is you have to get the right metaphor, right? It is, um, you know, there is about a 20 year old uh, program and it's not even a program, it's just a kind of a concept called the corporate athlete, okay? And what it is, is around this idea back to this metaphor that I was using a minute ago about elite athletes. We can all get behind that. We all understand necessarily um, if our favorite quarterback has to leave a game early in order to rest their hamstring, otherwise they're going to completely rip it and then they're out for the season. We might be a little stressed about that, but we understand. Yeah, you need rehab. Go to the locker. Don't practice this week. I sit, go to physical therapy, do what you need to do. So next Sunday you can get back on the gridiron and do your job. But in the corporate world as leaders, we don't translate to ourselves, right? We just keep pushing and pushing. So the metaphors and messages that we use, I think it's really important we do that in a way to get buy-in and that it's going to resonate. And so what's interesting in this space, I don't talk a lot about you need to get in touch with your feelings and you need to deal with your depression. I start, I get there, but I start with what is getting in the way of you optimally performing at work, but also in your life. Let's start there. Let's then identify functionally what is in the way. And then what do we need to do to get that out of the way or deal with those issues to get you optimizing your performance? as a father, as a mother, as a CPA, you know, whatever, whatever the, you know, your various roles that you wear uh, and hold in your day-to-day -day life. And then yes, maybe depression is one of them. Maybe substance abuse is one of them. Maybe marital strife is one of them. And we'll get into that. But when you lead, especially with leaders, with all the overly emotional stuff, sometimes it's a turnoff because then they have to admit, well, I'm weak. Right. So it's 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 not a way it's it's not it's kind of sidestepping the stigma for a second, but really getting down to what's the goal. The goal is to improve your functioning. And guess what? Your depression is getting in the way of your function. So we have to deal with that. Um, so mm -hmm. it's, it's how you message it and how you um, kind of use metaphors that people can relate to for growth. Yeah, that's great. So in looking at all this and thinking about if we don't break down that stigma, if we don't create an avenue where leaders can get the support that helps to meet them where they're at, what are some of the impacts that can happen to an organization? I know, you know, you mentioned culture. I'm sure culture breakdown could be a key uh, key area of, of concern. 
that could happen if you've got a leader that's not seeking help. But from both of your perspectives, from the work that you've done and what you've seen, what are some of those kind of cautionary watchouts if they're not addressing that leader well-being? Yeah, as we mentioned earlier, uh, the biggest thing we'll see is the shift in culture, um, and that leads to decreased productivity, po potentially absenteeism, um, and and turnover or the costly costly impacts of um, hitting their medical insurance. Right, there, there's these un unrelated but related consequences down the road that I think not everyone thinks about. Yep. Sorry, I'm making notes. Again, Sarah always like gets me thinking. Um, another one I think is presenteeism. And in fact, in some ways, I think that's as bad as absenteeism because it's harder to ferret out. And it, mm -hmm. it's like a cancer, right? It erodes slowly and gradually over time at the productivity, the innovation, the team building, the engagement across your employee ranks, right? Um, and that's kind of related to the quiet quitting, right? Um, and while many people understand what quiet quitting feels like as leaders, that is, that is a cancerous kind of thing in the organization um, because you just have people that are just not fully engaged. And what also happens that we don't talk enough about is when people are quiet quitting, when they're engaging in presenteeism, um, they're not feeling open. Either they don't care to give feedback or they're not feeling safe to give feedback. And how does the organization in a really healthy way shift and adapt and grow? You get feedback from your employees. What's working? Sarah said it earlier. What works? What doesn't work? What can we improve on? Right? That's really critical. So having that feedback loop the best organizations in terms of well-being and growth and year over year um, attracting talent and retaining talent, they have a good, healthy feedback loop. And so there's a number of ways that that really becomes kind of a uh, kind of an internal virus, if you will, or a cancer that really just eats away. Um, people do just enough not to get fired. Um, and then leaders wonder, why aren't we innovating? Why aren't we you know, branching ahead? So those are important things to keep in mind as well. Yeah, and I imagine the leader could be also that quiet quitter or just kind of coming in and doing their work but not really pushing it like they would have normally because they might mentally not be at the capacity to be able to do that. So That's interesting right. stuff. Yeah. So operationally, and I know the both of you have worked, you know, on the leader services that R3 launched this year in terms of the program. Talk to me a little bit about how an organization you know, tell me a little bit about the services that you have, and then we want to dive into how does somebody go about implementing that? Because, you know, we can talk all day long about the challenges, what they're experiencing, the impact on the organization, but let's dive into what do you do about it? How do you get this started? So share a little bit around, and I'm just going to kind of reverse a little bit what we were originally, the flow we were originally going to go with. Tell me a little bit about the leader services that were launched um, by R3 this year and how those are designed. Yeah, so there's sort of two arms to our, our leader services. One is a more clinical approach, which has been a lot of the focus of today's conversation um, with licensed clinicians. And then we also have a, a mental performance arm that uh, George touched on briefly here that's more geared toward um, maintaining high performance. We've got these leaders who are doing great. They're leading their teams to new levels or they might be someone who's new to a leadership level um, and they wanna keep them there. So that is more focused on how do we not only keep you performing at the level you're at, but um, gain some tactical skills, learn some blind spots to help you help you thrive there, promote resilience as George was mentioning earlier. Um, both In both of those services, we have curated a panel that has specific experience working with high performers. That's one of the gaps that we've seen um, is that, again, we talk, we're talking a lot about understanding the culture, coming in with a frame of reference. And that's huge. And that is one of the biggest drivers of success is meeting them where they're at. So having a panel who really understands the culture, um, the frame of reference, their what their life is like. They can, they can also talk the talk in session and just have that better understanding in alliance. Um, so they've got great experience in in that area um, and just have some deep tools to, to be able to bring to the table. 
George, is there anything you want to add with that? No, I, I mean, I'll just I'll just kind of double down on that curated panel notion. It's really yeah. important that you, you start with good, um, you know, mental performance coaches or good clinicians, depending on which service. And then from there, we really do. Um, we really try to work very closely with our clients to understand their culture. And then, and then, and then educate that panel on what are the cultural things that they need to understand about working with this organization. Um, mm -hmm. The analogy, it's funny, earlier in the week, a neighbor had a little fire pit and a few people came over and um, he is a huge like travel hockey dad, right? So both kids, his daughter and his son play travel hockey. They go all over the US. Uh, they're quite good actually, but, and he was talking about, you know, the difficulties of like when he's talking about the stressors of being a travel hockey parent, right? They flew in Sunday night, they landed at one in the morning and then the daughter of course wanted to, you know, uh, you know, just shower when she got home because they ran from the hockey rink to the plane. And then of course she had to get up quite early to go to school. Right. And there's just natural, there's just natural stressors that come in that world. And he was talking with his sister who lives in another state whose kids don't even play sports. And the sister had no reference. She just didn't get it. She's like, I don't get it. What's the big deal? Like, it should be exciting for your whole family. And so that's an example just of where you just don't understand the culture if you're not around it, or at least you're educated to some of the unique stressors. If you mm -hmm. fail in that way, and I think um, you highlighted this earlier, Sarah, if you fail in that way, when you first launch one of these programs, your leadership is gonna sniff that out and within the first quarter, there's going to just be a really bad taste across the organization that, yeah, they're offering this service, but they don't get us. They just don't get us. And so that, that's another aspect that I just want to double down on. It's really important to get that curated panel that's tailored with deep understanding of what the client's culture is and what their needs are. Yeah. I'm going to go back to the launching of it and making sure you've got, you know, all the right pieces in place. But one quick question that I hear quite a bit throughout the mental health industry is, you know, the wait time in finding a clinician. And I know from what I've kind of learned in the leader services, you know, R3 has some guarantees around how quickly they can match um, that employee to a provider, which I think is really key to what differentiates this program from maybe some other programs that might be out there. Can you speak a little bit to some of those kind of features and you know, really own ultimately like a benefit that a customer would get for their leadership team in working with R3? Yeah, so as we've talked about earlier, time is of the essence and making sure that there is um, alliance from the beginning. So one of the things that we do is we make sure that we keep the human touch throughout this whole process. Um, we have a live uh, clinician who will do an intake and spend the time with an individual to really understand what it is that they're looking for to make sure that we're, we're you know, heading in the right direction right from the start. Um, and then within that, we are able, again, as George was mentioning, we have a curated panel who we maintain close relationships with, who are excited about this work and who really enjoy and find interesting working with this population. Um, so they're, they're ready, they wanna work with us. Um, and so we're able to connect an individual with a, a provider in less than eight business hours, um, you know, 98% of the time. And not only are we doing that very quickly, but again, focusing on the best match and making sure that there is a strong alliance. Um, we have less than less than three percent of folks who ask for another provider um, after they've met had that initial that initial match. So again, we're taking the human human side of it to ensure that they raise their hand and ask for help, and we're going to get it right. Um, and not only um, are the, again, are they sticking with it, but we're seeing the improvements, right? People are continuing to engage. They're not just having one or two sessions. We're making it work for them so that, that they'll continue and, and meet their goals. Yeah, that that that's a critical point Sarah made, the alliance and that engagement at the outset. Because again, another difference and and I, you know, we keep talking, I keep I keep suggesting there's differences. And again, we're all human, 80%, 90% of across the board, 
whether you're the CEO or the janitor, there's commonalities. But one of the differences you do find in leaders is they have managed for 30, 40, 50 years, 60 years to push through, right? They have managed to push through, to soldier on, to carry on, um, to you know suppress different things necessarily. It's not uncommon that by the time they raise their hand and say, hey, I really need, I think I really need some support, whether it's mental, uh, mental performance coaching or whether it's clinical based services. Um, usually something is going on at a relatively significant level. And again, I'm speaking in generalities. So if you don't engage quickly, you risk that they're just going to go back to their default mechanism, right? I'm CFO of a billion dollar company. It's gotten me here this far. I'm finally open to talking to someone about my marital stress or maybe a death of a child or, you know, other stressful situations, but I'm not going to stay there if I don't get that linkage and that connection. So there's, to, to Sarah's point, there's windows of opportunity where I'm ready for change. There's a whole <laughs> literature on readiness for change. And if you don't catch me, catch me in that window and show that you at least have the potential to help me, there's a good chance I move on. And that's not what we want. We want people to get the help they need with the right person at the right time. So again, the, the alliance and the uh, engagement in, in a timely manner is critical. It's a great point, Sarah. Yeah. So I wanna leave a little bit of time for Q&A, but I wanna go back to that launching and I think you're hitting on it, You know, making sure that that program hits the mark the moment that it connects you know, that that gets rolled out in the organization. So let's talk about that implementation a little bit. How does R3 help employers to be able to have that implementation right? So talk a little bit about some of the tools, some of the, how do we, the resources, what do we do to make sure we've got that right in, in having that correct tailoring, but also the right materials? Yeah, um, as we mentioned earlier, it, it is putting the time and effort on the, on the onset of, getting and doing a deep dive and understanding the culture the the goals their frame of reference what are some of their external drivers and then tailoring the program um specific to that because as we started this whole conversation the overall need is not unique but each industry will certainly have and not only each industry but each organization will have their own nuances um, that need to be taken into consideration otherwise um, you you risk lack of engagement. Um, so we're there with you every step of the way. We'll help, um, you know, asking the questions that, that need to be answered in order to, to make this successful. Yeah, I guess I'll just um, kind of start where Sarah ended. And I think that's the key part is, you know, uh, an organization reaches out. We want to help our people. That's great. Awesome. How do you want to help them? In other words, what, what are you looking for? To Sarah's point, what are the outcomes that are driving what your interest, you know? We've had organizations that say, listen, we're landing on increased teamwork, we think is the most important thing. Because if people are engaging and working close together and team building together and working collaboratively, that's a great sign that people are feeling good about themselves and their coworkers. Others may have different, you know, different measurements or different outcomes they want to drive to. But the key is we start out by understanding what are you looking to uh, um, achieve? What's the outcome you're driving at? And then how do we kind of reverse engineer from there and figure out the best way to get there? And that includes messaging, it includes rollout, it includes, you know, what, even what metaphors do you use, right? Um, because it's really, you know, people think differently in different industries and different organizations, and you want to tap into that so you, it resonates. Yeah, yeah, great. You mentioned the messaging. Um, I think that is one place that we can really step in and help is this is new for a lot of folks and and it can be scary for for some leaders to to talk about so we can certainly help with that messaging both um in the internal leadership conversations but then as as it's being messaged out to those folks who who will be ultimately using the services to make sure that Again, we're, we're, as George mentioned, we're using the right metaphors, we're speaking the right language, and it's something that resonates. Wonderful. So at, I'm, I want to kind of drive into some cute questions here. Um, <clears throat> but before we do that, you know, as we wait for, you know, some of them to come through here and the, the audience have a chance to, 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 to 
write them. Um, just for everybody, if you are interested to have a question that you want to ask George or Sarah, uh, there is a Q&A box on the screen for you to use. Um, while we wait for some of those questions to come, I just want to call out some other resources that are also on your screen. So the widgets on the screen that are around the video player, uh, we have a resources list that you can tap into where we've got some ebooks and other information around the work that R3 is doing, the leader services that were mentioned in this webinar, as well as some case examples um, of leaders that have leveraged the services. Um, there's also Sarah and George's bios if you want to learn a little bit more about them or reach out to them via LinkedIn. And um, there's a call to action um, box or a box for you to be able to get information from us if you would like to connect with one of our representatives, um, get more information on the work that we're doing, see how this might work within your organization, um, just simply click that box and fill out the form and uh, we'll have somebody reach out to you. So, you know, we haven't had any questions come in just yet from the audience, but I just wanna ask Sarah and George as we kind of wait a little bit more, give people time to, to, to type those in if they have them. What are some additional things you wanna leave the audience with? If there was one key takeaway from this presentation or one key message around leader mental health that you want the audience to take with them as they consider how they navigate this going forward, what would that key takeaway be? Oh, you're on mute, Sarah. Sarah, I think you're on mute. Thank you, sorry. Um, I think one of the most important pieces is, um, to, again, we've driven it home a lot here, but understanding the culture and meeting folks where they're at and looking at it through through their lens and through their frame of reference to making sure that you're building something that that will work for them and that that they'll use. Yeah. And, and I and I, I guess mine, um, we're in an era now, especially coming out of the pandemic, where people really are focusing on a, a, not even a balance, a synergy between work, work life, right? Because um, it isn't always balanced. Sometimes it's, it needs to be synergistic. Um, you've got a younger, you know, a, a, a vastly growing, you know, uh, Gen Z and millennial generation coming up in the workforce, starting to enter and entering into leadership roles, as well as being the, the, the lion's share of the workforce. Um, and they, they're not going to tolerate workplaces that are toxic, are not at least reasonably promoting or giving them an avenue by which to live, you know, a, a life of reasonable well-being. Why is that all relevant? Because the bottom line is what we hear a lot um, from companies as they still adjust to this is, well, God, we love the idea, we just can't afford the program. And my rebuttal is you can't afford not to have programs mm -hmm. or support like this. Um, because it is, it, it, it may not get rid of your raw numbers of employees, it is going to drive away talent. You know, talent retention is going to go down, talent recruitment is going to go down. And with that, you know, important outcomes and KPIs and innovation are also going to go down. So um, it's really important, I think, for companies to ask the question, you know, we're either going to put resources and energy into supporting our people now, or we're going to spend a lot more later cleaning up kind of the mess that the lack of doing that is going to create. Yeah, yep. great point. Yeah, I'm not seeing any questions from the audience. So we are close to at the top of the time that we have allotted for this webinar. I wanna thank both George and Sarah for your time, your insights and your your expertise today on this topic. So thank you both for, atten uh, for, for being a part of our panel. My pleasure. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, thank you. And thank you all for attending. We hope you found this very informative. Again, if you need any information, it's they're available either in the resources list that we've provided for you, or please do reach out. We're happy to, to have a dialogue and a conversation around how these solutions might be impactful for your organization. We hope you have a great rest of your day, and thank you so much for tuning in. Take care.